Hey, Ben. Hey. Uh, so something that I think that everyone in this room will agree with is one of the appeals of your talks, of your debates, uh, is your rhetoric. It's the way that you, you think fast on your feet, quick responses to everyone, hard hitting. Um, so far, I like this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta soften you up first, you know. Um, so something I wanted to ask about is uh, Lorenzo, uh, the president of the College Republicans here, uh, in his introduction speech for you, uh, mentioned that uh, he, he gave some quotes, and one of the things was that you not only just talk, give your message, but you uh, work to inspire, you work to motivate. Uh, so something I wanted to ask is, um, when you do, uh, when you say things like uh, earlier in your speech, I think you called uh, your opposition driveling morons, something along those lines. Yeah, if you call me a white supremacist, you're a driveling moron, correct? So right, so. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, but what I would like to ask is, do you think that uh, when, you, when, you, when you go to rhetoric like that, um, that is so appealing to people who agree with you, I believe is just as alienating to people uh, that disagree with you. Um, and I would like to ask, do you think that, um, maybe not in this context, I agree, people who are calling white supremacists just, to, just because they differ with you, they're right. morons. But do you think that in a broader context or in maybe specific contexts in your past, uh, do you think that this it hurts your message? Do you think that it, people in sure, the middle? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something that I've been trying to get better at over time. As you get older, you try to become a better person. Uh, I will say that I was much more fond of calling people driveling morons 10 years ago than I am now. Um, but that, with that said, the, the reason that it is appropriate in this particular context is because I can't even have a conversation with you. If you're going to call me a white supremacist, and if that alienates people who think I'm a white supremacist, I really don't care. Because if you think I'm a white supremacist, I'm not interested in having a conversation with you because you are, technically speaking, a driveling moron. So that's so. It, it really does. <laughs> but it's. But you're right that it's context dependent. Meaning that there are times. I mean, Twitter is a place for you know kind of food fights. And so there are a lot of tweets where I've called people names. And there are cases where I've gone back and I've actually gone back and apologized to people and said, you know, that was really over the top. There's no reason for me to have done that. I've gotten together with people uh, and tried to you know apologize for doing that. I think it's what you try to do as a person who tries to get better at what you do every day. Um, I, I try to. Listen, I think punching back at bad ideas is really important, and punching back at bad people, which includes people who mislabel me deliberately. That's even more important for me. Um, but you have to be you know, tactical about where you're using your punches, and I think obviously overbroad application of, of insults is, is not particularly useful. Sure. Thank you. Franklin's funeral. Imagine a Republican standing next to David Duke at somebody's funeral. Would the controversy never end? Of course it would never end. But Bill Clinton can stand right next to Louis Farrakhan. No big deal. Linda Sarsour, who's a terrorist supporter, heads the Women's March. And Democrats continue to associate with the Women's March. No problem there. Democrats in the last election cycle elected two anti-Semites, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. And we pretended it was all just, you know, it's great. It's diversity. It's Muslim members of Congress. Well, there can be Muslim members of Congress who aren't anti-Semitic. These two don't fit the bill. Tlaib denies that Jews ought to have a state. She stands in favor of the anti-Semitic boycott sanctions divestment movement. She's expressed admiration for the anti-Semitic terrorist Razmia Odea, and she is in Congress now. Omar is even worse, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. In 2014, she tweeted, quote, Israel has hypnotized the world. May Allah awaken the people and help them see the evil doings of Israel. Have you heard a peep about this from a single Democrat? Like any Democrat? Of course not. They'll talk about Steve King until the cows come home, which is fine, but they have nothing to say about Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib. In Britain, the next prime minister of Britain could be Jeremy Corbyn, who's openly anti-Semitic and sympathizes with Hamas and Hezbollah. Okay, all of this is truly more threatening because, again, if you believe in this intersectional politics, this also means that you are more sympathetic to people who are anti-Semitic as long as they are coming from downtrodden areas of the world. The rise in anti-Semitism in Europe is largely not due to radical nationalists in Europe. It is largely due to radical Islamists who have been imported into the heart of Europe and are attacking Jews at record rates, which is why Jews are now leaving Europe at record rates. Okay, so here's the bottom line. If you actually want to fight anti-Semitism, and I'm speaking to people right, left, and center now, you need to actually fight anti-Semitism when you see it. You don't get to call out one form of anti-Semitism while ignoring other forms. You don't get to claim that it exists only on one side of the aisle when it exists much more on your own side of the aisle. And you certainly don't get to claim that those of us who have spent our entire lives fighting anti-Semitism are members of a white supremacist movement. Anti-Semitism goes to the root of what it means to be American. It is blatantly un-American. America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. We get the eternal values upon which the country was founded from the same Bible that Moses brought down from Sinai, addended by Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. 
George Washington wrote to the Jewish community of Newport in 1790, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. An attack on the tree of life was not just an attack on Jews. It was an attack on all Americans. It was an attack on all Jews, too, not just Jews in Pittsburgh, but the Jews who are currently living in their basements for fears of rockets falling on them from the Gaza Strip, the Jews who are afraid to walk the streets in France wearing a yarmulke for fear that they will be beat up or killed, the Jews who are leaving Malmo, Sweden, because they can't walk safely at night in the streets. It was an attack on all those Jews, but it was an attack on Americans more broadly, too. Anyone who wishes to imbue our children with a sense of godliness in a dark world and a sense of eternal value in a society that is currently eating away at itself. The only proper response to anti-Semitism is to fight back against it wherever we see it and to stubbornly cling to that which stamps us with the image of God, to fight darkness with light and untruth with truth and death with light. You have this incentivization to maximize your profits to the utmost and it leads to people doing evil and immoral things. And when even like you don't want to do immoral things in the market, you're booted out by your competitor who is willing to maximize their profits in that way. And so you can't even compete. And if you won't maximize, then you're automatically kicked out of the market. Okay, so first of all, I think it's a complete, a complete misread of capitalism. Capitalism is a, re, is a repeated iteration game. So you have an incentive to screw, you may have the incentive to screw somebody in a one-off transaction. But the reality is that you are not going to succeed economically if you screw millions and millions of people in transactions in which there are competitors and there's enough transparency in order to find out about it. So the examples that you give, you know, like the prison industrial complex, as, as you suggest, I don't actually think that criminal justice laws are being written by the wardens at the prisons. I think that there are a lot of people who are afraid of crime, and that is why they have passed these particular criminal laws. Now, I may be against some of those, right? I'm, I'm in favor of decriminalization of marijuana, for example, because I think that the government has completely failed at it. It's been a terrible idea. But I, I, wouldn't, attribute that to the out, uh, I wouldn't attribute that to the outgrowth of capitalism. Communism was the, the ruling philosophy in the Soviet Union, and they had legitimately tens of millions of people living in giant gulags. Uh, so communist states are not actually known for their freedom of, of movement. Um, the, uh, as far as the, the other example that you were using, you know, drug, drug companies that are that are attempting to create more and more addictive drugs. Again, there are torts that, I mean, we do have tort laws that allow us to sue these companies if they are, if they are mislabeling things, they get fined out of existence in some cases. Uh, they, uh, I will, but, and, to, and to point out the cases in which bad actors misuse capitalism is to point out that human nature involves bad actors. Okay, capitalism is just the idea that you are a sovereign human being with the capacity to create a product and sell it at the price you choose and that I, as a consumer, have the capacity to buy that product at a price that I choose to pay. That is legitimately the essence of capitalism. Anything else in which you are hijacking the state in order to promote yourself is not capitalism. That's not capitalism, that's corporatism. Anything else where you are attempting to you know, defraud somebody, that's criminal in every capitalist state. I mean, we do have crime, fraud crimes. Uh, and again, I would be remiss unless I acknowledge that capitalism has also led to a, a halving of the global poverty rate over the last 40 years. I mean, pe people living in abject poverty, that has been halved on a global rate by capitalism. Your life is awesome because of capitalism. The people who are living in Europe, their life is awesome because of capitalism. Places that don't have property rights are places and, and free alienation of, of the products and services that you create, those are places that live in impoverishment, those are places that collapse in on themselves. And for all the people who say that, you know, look at the Nordic countries, right, because the Nordic countries are all based on capitalism, and then they redistribute the profits, which you can do, right? I mean, that's the thing you can do. But that is not a rip on capitalism. That is a suggestion that you redistribute the profits. And I have, a, I have a lot of cases against that, but to pretend that, like, Norway is a good example of social means of control of the means of production is just not the case. It's just not true. Yeah, you can follow up. That's fine. Right. So you mentioned how the prison system like the laws, most of the laws are at least justifiable. Why would we have five times like the proportion in relation to the rest of the world? Like are Americans like we, more we, inherently we do, violent or like? We, well, number one, we have a lot of drug crimes and number two, but more than that, there are a lot of criminals. I mean, it, it's not enough to just say there's a disparity. We have to, attri we have to figure out why that disparity exists right. and you have to explain, do you think that there are like a bunch of innocent people who are in prison right now? Do you think that yes. we have 
four times as many innocent people in prison in the United States. We're a giant gulag state. We're just running out there. The cops are running out there and arresting people willy-nilly on the streets in order to fill the prisons because we have to have a prison industrial complex? I mean, I think because most people who are in prison is the result of like, like petty drug crimes, That's in a not sense. true. The, the vast majority of people in prison are in prison for non-drug crimes. This is true on a state and a federal level. And statistically speaking, it's just not the case that 80% of the people in prison are in prison because of drug crimes, and certainly not possession crimes. There are a lot of people in, 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 by the way, most of the people who are in prison because of possession crimes are in prison for possession crimes because they were actually drug dealers and they pled down to drug possession. Because our prison system is indeed overcrowded because we have too many people committing crimes. But... You know, I, I'm not sure that that is a result. You'd have to show me the innocent person in prison, then I agree with you. You want to show me an innocent person in prison, or you want to show me a law that you feel is not justified by its effect, then we can actually have a conversation. But the mere statement that we have a lot of people in prison doesn't answer the question as to whether people should actually be in prison. If they're committing crimes, they should be in prison. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Shapiro. This question is brought to you by our sponsors, Birch Gold. I appreciate it. Um, so, you want to diversify. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> so how do you suggest that we go about having discussions on hot button issues, things like gun control, um, social, re uh, like social issues, economic redistribution, without being labeled as being hateful or being mean or anything like that? And also, um, on your show, you talk a lot about concealed carry. You promote concealed carry. You um, talk about concealed carry insurance from USCCA. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, what is your concealed carry pistol? I'm sorry, what is my concealed carry? Your, well, yeah, what's your concealed carry firearm? Uh, well, I, I'm in California. I, it's, it's a May issue state, so I can't actually get a concealed carry license, despite the myriad death threats that I receive on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so if I carried, I'd have to carry illegally, um, which I don't. Or do I? <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, but, the, uh, but as far as how to have these sorts of conversations, the first thing you have to do in any conversation is try to determine whether the person is interested in a useful and profitable conversation or whether they're not, whether they're really there just to yell at you. And if they're there just to yell at you, then it's a complete waste of time and you shouldn't actually engage with that person. If somebody is debating with you in public and they bring out the racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe routine uh, and they have no evidence to back it, which presumably they shouldn't since you seem like a nice person, right? if, that's the, if, if they do that, then I, as I've always said, the proper response is not, I'm not a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, let's talk about this. The proper response is, you're a jackass, I can't have a conversation with somebody who says I'm a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe without evidence. Right? Once you get rid of that, once you say, listen, you have to assume the best of intentions on my part and I will assume the best of intentions on your part and then we can have a rational conversation, that's when good conversations can happen. But if you're assuming bad, bad intent on somebody else's part before the conversation even begins, it's going to be very difficult to have an open and honest conversation. The same thing with them for you. If they're assuming that the reason that you want concealed and carry is because you actually don't care about dead kids at Sandy Hook or something. Right? If, this is, if this is their actual position, there's no good conversation to be had there. Then the only question is why you're having the conversation in the first place. If, if you're you know, doing it in private, then I would assume you probably shouldn't. If you're doing it on CNN, destroy Piers Morgan. Yes, sir. Thank you.